What's going on, ladies and gents? Super psyched that you're here. I think I went ahead and, and messed this up. I don't know which way up is. It's going to be a good lunch and learn today. Uh, we are February 12th. I've got a pretty cool agenda. Um, and I do want to say beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you have not read through one of the most impactful threads in this group, you are 100% missing out. There was an amazing thread. Um, somebody asked like who makes over 20 K a month, which is usually like, like a bait or a value post or some type of like negative connotation taught by some people in the space of like how to source clients and customers. And, and ultimately that's what I'm not trying to build inside of the buck group. I'm not trying to be the next click funnels or anything like that. What I really want is a, like a real honest conversation. Um, and then knowing that everybody does have something to sell, that's okay too. But, but in the group, just have a real honest conversation and let the thread build whatever value you feel is okay for somebody who wants to pay you money. It's really been like the stance or so. I, like I really don't like PMing and, and all that stuff. Um, and, and because of that, uh, a really cool thread popped out. Somebody said, who's making over 20 K a month. A bunch of people started raising their hand and I immediately said like, all right, $20 bounty. If you get any unsolicited PMs, like I'm going to give you 20 bucks and, and I'll ban the person. But what was really, really cool is the conversation that came out of it. Absolutely fantastic. 384 comments, people ranging from just starting out to people that are doing $500,000 a month, a huge breadth and depth of real life conversations and real life Q and A's and what do you suggest and what should you be doing and, and all that stuff. It was so darn awesome. Um, if you haven't seen it, you really, really should. I'm going to put a comment in there. I really suggest after this lunch and learn that you go give it a thorough read because there are some people in this group and in this thread that have asked those questions six months ago, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, and they've done what people in the thread said and have grown to a point where they are now giving the same advice saying, yes, you should do this. No, you should do that. Uh, this is good. This is bad. And it was really, really cool having a real honest conversation. People that are doing, like I mentioned, a half million a month in the butt group. And they were talking about margins and pros and cons. And, and it was absolutely fantastic. Some people who have sold an agency and then decided to rebuild it or do something different. Some people who take equity in other agencies. It was really, really cool. So I really suggest that if you're, you're challenged with your agency, go ahead and read that thread. It is pretty darn awesome. It's really, really darn cool. Um, and like I mentioned before, I think today's lunch and learn is going to be pretty, uh, I, I keep saying darn cool all over again, whatever guys, I'm doing this on the fly. Uh, today's lunch and learn, we have an option. Uh, I'll just bring this up on my screen right now. Um, and I, I, I really want to, to know what would best fit you and would solve your problems faster. So we could right here, we could go over the three structural pillars to selling. Um, and this is something that I've been mulling around in my head when I drove up to my sales manager's retreat in Orlando, Mike Mark, um, and really just trying to synthesize what I'm learning from other books, what I'm learning from Facebook groups, and what I'm learning from real life small businesses I'm having a conversation with. I try to spend two hours a day learning, um, whether that's by reading or doing or thinking or something like that. Um, and so we can talk about the three structural pillars of selling, like the expert style. So like Russell Brunson, I'm the best. I'm the world. Dan Henry style, like I'm amazing. You should listen to me. I'm the best. The pros and cons in that. And then move into uh, the Amazon or Walmart style, which is like just have more stuff to sell without you doing it. So like white labeling somebody else or referral partners or something like that else, something else. And finally, number three, which is the three P process, which is how doctors, lawyers, and accountants sell. Like, like no doctor in the world is banging his chest saying I'm the best in the world. They don't do that, right? Uh, doctors that sell will sit down with you, understand your problem, outline a process or a plan to solve that, and then promise something at the end of the three P's. Um, I think having a, an understanding of which sales type um, or structural pillar to selling fits you and your target market it makes a lot of sense. But I also know that there's an F ton of people that have very specific questions and another thread of like 30 or so comments. So let me know in the chat if number one, you want to go over the three structural pillars to selling or number two, you want me to handle the, um, the big Q and a thread by Pat and Ryan and no and Reed and Francis and Carlos and Maria and Marilyn and Cameron Lang. Um, give me a number one in the chat or a number two. Um, whichever one is 
totally fine by me. I do this as like um, as a way to pay it forward to the same way somebody paid it forward to me. Um, and all sponsored by my grandmother's uh, amazing art. This is fruit and, and it's a fruit bowl and you can't tell me any different. And as soon as somebody says it's not a fruit bowl, uh, they're a liar. And there's no way my 92 year old grandmother who is hilarious and perverted would ever paint anything other than a fruit bowl. So yeah, take a look at that. So number one, if you want me to do the structural uh, pillars of selling um, or number two, the top 10 q and I have my own preference for number two, but we'll see what happens. Let me go ahead and bring up the chat and all that stuff. In the meantime, though, uh, Brett Factorist, what's going on? How you doing? Daniel Shaik, got that wrong. Anton Gray, thank you for having an aim that I can easily pronounce. Pat, how you doing? Jesse, Christille, James Donovan, Wayne Gilchrist, met him uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, flew all the way from Alaska. Howard Tiano, how you doing? James Pond, what's going on? James Pond sold customer research for a thousand bucks to three separate people, which is really darn cool. Um, and most of the people actually in this chat right now are part of the inner circle. So if you're interested in taking a next step of the IC, just hashtag ICL. Brett, reach out to you and they'll take it from there. Um, Christine says, like a grandma, like grandson. I, uh, that's about right. Um, yeah, so number one or number two, it looks like we're like split even halfway down. So I'm going to move into Q&A. Um, we're going to make sure we can solve your problems, alleviate your pains, move you forward, all that fun stuff. I've got a thread over on off screen that you can't see. Actually, let me just rearrange all this stuff this way. I've got a thread, um, and I think it, it's going to be purposeful and make a lot of sense for people who have these challenges. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to add to it, just put in the chat for now, and um, we'll take it from there. But the first question is from uh, Pat, who says, Pat, what's your experience with white labeling, good and bad? So here's the big mistake, white labeling. Uh, here's the big mistake most people make with their white labeling. And before I go into that, I want to say white labeling is a real awesome way of entering in a niche that you have no direct experience in. It's a real awesome way of making sure you get your client real life results. It's a really awesome way of getting stuff off your plate to an expert. And you can usually enjoy 30 to 50% margins. So if you, for example, want to spin up an HVAC prospect engine, uh, you don't have to be an HVAC expert. You can employ one of the HVAC experts and they just want to make like 50K a month and live on a beach and, and only work two hours a week. And so they can do that if they just do one thing, which is HVACs. And then they'll probably do a specific type of HVAC and then they have their own process. So like white labeling is totally legitimate. Most of the way you've bought in the past has been white labeling or something along those effects, uh, along those lines. Um, but the big mistake that people make with their white labeling is they will white label the tool instead of white labeling the result. This is the big mistake people make. They white label the tool instead of white labeling the result. Here's what I mean. Someone or someone will go get a client that wants Facebook ads. The agency doesn't have the capacity or the knowledge base to do Facebook ads. So they hire someone else to do Facebook ads. Normal, no big deal. I'm using Facebook ads so, because you can be like, uh, I don't know if that's okay. It's right on the edge, but it's fine. Really no big deal. Like I don't care if it was like newspaper or, or somebody page bill at 85 landing pages. You, you just find someone else and, and swap contracts or, or make your margin or something like that. Um, but this is usually what happens. Somebody will, go, will get a client that wants Facebook ads. The agency doesn't have the capacity, so they find someone else to do Facebook ads. It's normal, makes complete and total sense. Um, so the agency will take the client's money, uh, hire the white labeler, and everything will go to hell. Like right out of the gate. Like immediately everything is bad. And ultimately it's because the white labeler is white labeling Facebook ads, but the client wants results. And so the agency, which is the person in the middle, is stuck between a client that wants results and a provider that is used to the tool. And, and that's, that's an inherent structural failure. And that is literally what will cause your agency to relapse and shrink instead of growing. So instead of finding a white labeler, or let's just say Facebook ads, or landing pages, or automations, or whatever, you want to find I see. There you go. This is what I get for typing and talking at the same time. Uh, you want to find someone who 
white labels the intended result. What is the intended result? Let's just say 30 customer opportunities a month, as an example. Um, 15 phone calls a day. Uh, high ticket, high quality, long form appointments for sales, inquiries, for insurance services. Something like that, right? Like you want to white label the result, not the tool. So if a client comes to me and they're selling uh, insurance and they're like, Jeff, I really, really want Facebook ads. My brain will say, great, I've got a guy that does Facebook ads. Here's money, make the difference. That client, they don't really want Facebook ads. That's like going to a surgeon saying, hey, can you chop me up and give me a scalpel? Like that's not going to happen. And so the agency's job in this case is not simply to collect money, but to dig deeper and find a purpose behind the inquiry. Like, so why are you reaching out? What's like the deeper reason? Like do your onboarding docs. Like what are you trying to get from your Facebook ads? What's the intended result? Oh, you know, I just, I really want to grow my business. I need more sales. Okay. But what type of sales? Like what's your dream client? What are you looking for? Uh, you know, I, I just really want people calling my business. Okay, how many phone calls are you talking? When they're calling, what are they calling about? Spend your 15 or 30 minutes instead of just saying, yeah, we can do that. Just have a stronger conversation. Your client will stick around longer and then you can find a better white labeler. And you'll see me in the public group say like, hey, does anybody white label appointments for insurance? Because somebody asked me, hey, can you get me more appointments for my insurance company? So now I can just do the difference. I can only just say like, hey, I've got somebody who does high ticket, high quality, long form appointments for insurance services. I know it'll cost me 500 bucks. I charge 1500. There you go. So like the, the biggest mistake that people make with white labelers is they white label the tool, Facebook ads or SEO or blah, 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 when they should be white labeling the result. And the, the reason why an agency gets paid isn't because they're simply brokering the deal. The reason why an agency gets paid is because they're spending the extra 30, 40 minutes trying to figure out the reason why they want Facebook ads and then finding someone who can get that result. And so that's the biggest mistake that people make when it comes to white labeling. Once you start changing how you find white, la white labelers, it's, it's much easier. Like, like I've got an HVAC guy that's like, Jeff, I need Facebook ads. So I could have, I don't know, like if I said like, hey, it's gonna charge you, I'm gonna charge you $2,000 a month for Facebook ads. He could have gone anywhere else and got Facebook ads a service for like 200 bucks a month. But if I said, hey, what are you really looking to get? You want sales? you want appointments, you want booked deals, you want people calling your business, it's much harder to cost compare that. So I have a higher propensity of landing the deal in the first place. So I hope that provides context to your question. Um, and as it turns out, I totally lost the thread just now. Where'd it go? Okay, here we go. So that's my experience with white labeling good and bad. What sometimes happens is the white labeler will totally bomb the campaign it happens like it, there's structural reasons behind it either this person like was oopsie daisied or you didn't prompt them correctly or you just think all you have to do is is pass the business and make your margin um half the time campaign bombs is because of the agency's choice in the let's just say subcontractor Half the time the campaign bombs because the business uh, just isn't, let's just say, Facebook ads friendly. And that's like a placeholder term for like isn't open to new business or like doesn't have a good offer or something like that. I can't give you like what happens or the, the core reasons why it always bombs, but for the most part, it's one of these two camps. Um, and so what you really need to do is, is pre-plan for this campaign to bomb. And the easiest way for your campaign to actually bomb is to make the implication or accidental until promises to your client. This is the biggest reason why your campaign bombs, not because of like the, the campaign actually bombing, but because the intended result of the bombing. That just sounds weird. I should pro probably stop saying that. So this is what I mean. Let's say a plastic surgeon comes to me and says, Jeff, I need Facebook ads. Again, this is my job as an agency to dive deeper, find out what they really want and get it done. So the plastic surgeon then says, okay, 
I need more surgeries. Cool. Now that we're talking something more specific, it's harder for him to Google and harder for him to find a, another person or, or just structurally, it's a, much easier for me to keep my client if we're having a conversation about surgeries instead of conversation about Facebook ads, right? Um, so now that I know that, I can pre-deal or pre-conquer any problems with the campaign bombing. Here's what I mean. If the campaign bombs in 30 days and the client expects it to go well in 30 days, campaign bomb. It's like that. But if the client expects this to take 60 or 90 days and the campaign secretly bombs, in the first 30 days, well, now I've got time to find a new white labeler, white label person. I think structurally at the core, the reason why campaign bombs is because your, ex your client expects it to be amazing instead of saying it's going to take 30 days to get everything up and running. And this is a 90 day engagement and it's going to be $6,000 over 90 days and half that's going to your white labeler, and you have two different narratives. For your client, so this is like the client right here. You tell your client it will take, let's just say 60 to 90 days to build everything, get it working, and get you four to five surgeries a month. Let's just say that What's going on with your client right here. You have 60 to 90 day timeline to your white labeler. You're saying I need this campaign up and running within three weeks. Now you literally have, let's just say 90 divided by 21. You have four different time frames for white labelers. And so, Pat, to answer your question, like when your campaign bombs, it's usually not because it actually bombed. It's because your campaign didn't spin up according to your client's expectations. So you actually have two separate levels of expectations. You tell your white label, look, I need this thing up and running within three weeks. Does that fit within your SLAs? Great. Here's money. Get started. You tell your client it's going to take between 60 and 90 days to get everything up and running, working and steady. So you're getting five to four to five surgeries a month. Is that acceptable? Great. Here's how it's going to work. You're going to pay me $5,000 for the 90 day engagement. Let's get started. That's the easiest way of doing it. And the coolest part is if your white labeler bombs, like hardcore, most white labelers have some kind of guarantee or warranty. Like if they don't get the campaign up and running a certain amount of time, uh, they'll refund your money. Um, if your campaign doesn't actually perform within three weeks, they'll refund your money, um, something like that. And so you really only pick white labelers that have some type of guarantee or warranty. This comes with them white labeling for results. So most will have a guarantee, warranty, or timeline. This type of stuff. Um, so ultimately at the core, like the reason why a campaign bombs is there's, I'm just kind of summarizing right here in case somebody's watching the replay. Number one, your campaign bombs because your client expected something different. Your campaign bombs because you found a white labeler that focuses on a tool and not the result. Um, your campaign bombs because you didn't stack timelines because you didn't find a white labeler with an SLA service level agreement, timeline, or guarantee. And, and at the core, this is mostly because you're finding white labors that focus on a tool. So once you start focusing on white labors that focus on a result, they will automatically do this, and you won't have that much of a problem anymore. More so, if it does bomb, you're stacking timelines in a way to where you can find another white labeler and still with be, be within your clients like challenges or something like that. So I hope that answers your questions. Let's see if uh, Pat has a follow-up. Um, Pat's follow-up is...
at, says, what happens when the white label doesn't get results that they promise our company name is on the line, not theirs? Um, chances are, again, I, I guess you asked this when I was halfway through. I just saw it. Um, when white labors don't get the results, it's because you're white labeling for a tool and not a result. They don't get the result. They have like warranties. They have timelines. They have SLAs. Most people who are white label have a higher level of, of expectation when they're doing for results rather than just the tool or something like that. So I think I answered this like in the replay or something like that. Let's see what else. Uh, ba -da -ba -ba. No, Noe, Noah, something like that. Noah says, how to train and hire appointment setter for a specific niche as a newbie. Um, here's something interesting. I was just chatting with uh, somebody in the group named Jessica about this earlier today. Uh, most people accidentally hamstring and totally F over their appointment setters. And I don't know what happened. This has like come up in the past like six months or so. Like for some reason, everybody was like, oh, I just got an appointment setter and everything's going to be fine. I just, you know, pay $15 for appointment. Everything's going to be okay. And so what ends up happening, an agency will have a need to get appointments. So they say, of course, all I have to do is hire an appointment setter, something like that. And, and this is a, <laughs> this is a big fat do not do this. This is going to bomb you and it's going to ruin everything. This is not how you should be thinking about what you're doing and how you're doing it. You're going to have a bad time. This is an incorrect line of thinking. If you need appointments, that does not mean you actually just hired appointment setter. This is fundamentally incorrect. The reason why appointment setters work, this is how appointment setters work or work well or something like that. This is what happens. You get a list of, let's just say, future clients that have said yes. They want to buy what you have to sell. They heard your cold email pitch. They've signed up. They've raised their hand and said, here's my name, number, and email. Call me back. right? And then you hire an appointment setter and pay them, let's just say, uh, about $15 per or about $15 for a scheduled appointment. And a, I think it's like a percentage, I don't remember what, for a closed deal. That's how you do it. This is how it's supposed to work. Most agencies that, that mess up their appointment setters, they'll just simply say, oh, I need appointments, I'm gonna hire an appointment setter, and not give that appointment setter a list. Not make sure that list is somewhat quality. Not make sure that, that, that the list has like yeses on it. Um, and, and they just, they'll totally bomb it and then they'll hate them. And it's like, oh, I can just hire a stay at home mom to make calls for me and she'll call random businesses. No, you're, you're going to burn them out and you're going to develop a bad reputation. And then even then, like, like you're not really doing appointments for just appointments sake. You're doing appointments as like a pre-sale so that your salesperson is lined up for success, which you can't do with like cold appointment setting. It's just, it's not good for you. So you have to literally just do some type of prospecting engine. And then your appointment setters will go through that prospecting list and then schedule appointments from there. That's the easiest way to do it. I'm not having any success with this stupid arrow right here. Come on. There we go. So let's just say you build a list of 500, I don't know, HVAC companies that have said, yes, I want to get more appointments for my HVAC services. And then you get that list. Uh, and then you have your appointment setter go through the, something like that. So like your prospecting engine needs to spin up and your appointment setter will help turn prospecting yeses into sales appointments. Uh, you can't just hire an appointment setter and say, oh, good luck, right? That's not going to work. Um, you're going to develop a bad rep and have a bad idea. Instead, you literally have to create a list of like HVAC companies that have said yes. And then your appointment setter goes through that list and calls everyone back and schedules sales calls and then you pay them $15 for a scheduled appointment. And then and I don't know the percentage, you're gonna have to ask the group, but this is how appointment setters work. And so no's question is like, how do I train and hire appointment setter for a specific niche? This is 90% of it, like right here. 
if you're not doing this, it doesn't matter what type of other answers I give you because this is the structural core reason why your appointment setter will work or not. Once you have this, then you can create a script, which is like along the lines of, hey, Mr. Johnson, I saw you signed up for our HVAC ATP program where we can get you two, three more HVAC appointments every single month. Is that still something you're interested in? Great. Well, if you'd like, I can schedule time between you and Brett for this Thursday at 2 p.m. He's going to show you how the program works, how much it costs, and when you can get started. Is that something you're interested in? Great. What's your best phone number? What's your best email? I'll go ahead and send you stuff. And then between the signing up of the appointment and the appointment itself, they're getting text messages with proof, a soap opera sequence, they're like the retargeting ads kick in. So like they're prompted for that sales conversation. So no, I, I, I think, or Noe, Noah, I'm not sure, dude. Um, but like, this this is appointment setting that works. If all you're doing is this, it, it's going to bomb. Instead, you need to be doing something like this. So I hope that makes a lot of sense. Maria says this right here. Maria says, if you're just starting out and you don't have case studies, what can you do? Um, so Maria, this is something that we specifically cover in the IC. If you're interested in, in taking the next up the IC and asking about just hashtag IC, uh, we do stuff like this all the time and specifically deal with people who don't have case studies um, because we, we literally give you like 15 case studies that you can white label. Um, but I'm just assuming that for your answer, you're going to say zero case studies. And so the end result is like you really don't need case studies, previous results, or experience to land a client like that's just it's it's incorrect your brain freaks out because you don't think you're good enough you don't have a plan so you're saying oh god i need a case study like all of a sudden if you had all the case studies in the world like you'd be rich as shit and it's, it's not true it's fundamentally at the core incorrect you don't need previous old experience or case studies to land a client what you need come on here we go you need to show them a plan and this is part of the three P process. This is like one of the ways of selling one of them expert driven, which relies on uh, expertise and improves those experience with case studies. Another one is like, just have more stuff to sell and white label everything. Um, but last is the three P process. This is how like accountants like sell stuff um, in a way that makes a lot of sense. This is how everybody gets their start. If you're sub 20 K a month, you're, you're probably not going to get wins by magically getting a case study. Like it, it's not how it works. That's a lie in the industry. Um, and everybody that's like, over 20, 30, 50 K a month, like they're relying on case studies, but they didn't have them when they were starting out. So Maria, I'm assuming like you're sub 20 K a month, you need to be doing this. The first is you need to have, make sure that you have got a problem, process and a promise. This is the three P's. Let me just write this out now. Three P's to selling when you don't have case studies. Again, Maria, we give everybody in the IC a bunch of case studies. So we shortcut their learning curve. If this is something you're interested in exploring, uh, we've got two more slots and then we close out the cohort. You can just hashtag IC and Brett will reach out. Um, but this is, where does it go? Here we go. So the three P's to selling when you don't have case studies. And this is how you break into new niches. This is how you get new business. Most times like leaning on a case study will ultimately make your client disappointed because uh, it's like, oh my God, I didn't get the results this guy got. Everything is bad, stuff like that. So let me just go ahead and here we go. So the problem uh, in, inside of the IC is something called onboarding docs, where we ask 10 to 15 questions. So our client knows that we understand their problem. Um, this is how accountants get business. This is how doctors get business. This is how lawyers get business. They literally sit down with you for five, 10 minutes and say, all right, I'm ask you a series of questions. Um, just answer them truthfully. And uh, we'll know if, if there's a problem that I can solve. If there's, I'll show you how we do it and tell you how much it costs. Great. So like your lawyer is going to say, so what happened? Your doctor is going to say, what hurts? Your accountant is going to say, how much do you owe the IRS? Something like that. And secretly inside of those 10 to 15 questions, you're quantifying the problem. You're making clear that they don't have a solution. You're seeing how much it hurts. And if this is like a million dollar problem, that they should be solving and spending money with you. Um, so we ask onboarding docs, um, 10 to 15 questions so your client knows that we, the agency, understand their problem. Again, if you have case studies or previous results experience, you don't have to do this as much. But usually when you do, somebody's like more open to the idea of hearing your pitch and you can develop a USP very quickly or something like that. 
So Mr. Johnson, um, you know, after looking at these onboarding docs, I definitely think I thoroughly understand your problem. Um, if you'd like, I can show you behind the scenes of how a high performing marketing campaign works, how much it costs and when you can get started called the wallet out ready by button the seat customer campaign. Are you interested in learning about that? Yes. Cool. So now you've got somebody saying, let's talk. I want to do some business. Um, let me just go ahead and check and make sure the stream is up and running. Something flickered. I don't know where it went. Where is it? Where did BeLive go? Oh, here we go. All right, cool. So we're still up and running. So then we show them the process. I have the wallet out campaign, the named campaign, the brand name, whatever is just, just don't call it Facebook ads or Google SEO. Like don't use the tool. It's not going to work. Don't use the tool and said, have a cool name. So I've got the wallet out ready to buy, but in the seat customer campaign, the seven steps behind the high performing marketing campaign, Mr. Johnson, uh, this is kind of like going to the gym. You go once. Um, everything is okay. You go twice, everything gets better. You do all seven, all of a sudden you're ripped with a six pack, right? So you want to do the equivalents for your business. And then we show them the seven steps. You can look at the Alex Chalinsky inter interview I did last week. You can look at Alex Chalinsky's masterclass. You can join the IC and see me actually pitch with the whiteboard behind my screen. Um, I can't show you that. Uh, that's some like ASCON stuff, but the wallet out ready by button seat customer came in. Here's the seven steps that would take you through. This is our process. This is what works. Mr. Johnson, now that you've seen how we run our high-performing marketing campaigns, is this something you're interested? Can you see how Rose's business? Would you like to know how much it costs? Blah, 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 blah. And Mr. Johnson, I'm the only person in the industry with a promise and a guarantee. I promise you'll get 30 customer opportunities a month, every month from the day your campaign goes live. If you do not get 30 customer opportunities a month, every month when your campaign goes live, I will pay your next month's bill. I will take money out of my pocket and pay my team to turn your campaign for another 30 days. And if you don't get 30 customer opportunities that month, I will pay your next month's bill again. And that will continue until you get 30 customer opportunities. You fire us or we fire you. What are you, what are you thinking? Or when do you want your results? When would you like to get started? Blah, blah, blah. If you have this, you do not need pre-results experience or case studies. But if you don't have this, your brain freaks out and says, oh my God, I need a case study. So Maria, I hope this answers your question in a way that's like repeatable and, and very clear. If you don't have case studies, results, experience, you have to sell the 3P process. This is, this is how it'll work. By the way, as a side effect of having a 3P process, your confidence in your program will shoot through the roof, like massively. So Maria, there you go. Marilyn then says, The process you go through for the setup only clients. Cool. So this is something I've been experiencing and messing around just to see if it would work. When I look at other people that are much more massively successful, uh, they present their client with options. Something like this. Again, this is like a little bit more advanced. I really do not suggest you do this until you have like, until you have it down pat and like you can predict a sale is going to happen like halfway through. And it's just a problem with money. It's not an offer problem. It's not a pitch problem. It's a payment problem. Only use this if it's a payment problem. You've got somebody who wants to buy what you have to sell. You know it works. You don't have fear about fulfillment. Now it's just like getting money out of them type thing. So I call it pick your poison. What I discovered is that very often I'd be pitching to small business owners that like that just consume information differently than me. Like if you're a martial arts business owner, like you want to do it yourself, everything. If you're a plastic surgeon, uh, I'm, I would never stoop to doing Facebook ads. I'm a plastic surgeon. Oh my God. Um, if I'm a pest control, I love the idea of learning and I want someone to help me figure it out. Like depending upon the industry and the dollars of that industry, they consume the deliverable in a different way. And I'll bet what you didn't know, there's actually three ways to, to deliver your 10 result, which is 30 customer opportunities guaranteed. Again, this is more advanced. I can do it for you. I can coach you through it or I can install everything. And these are just different ways of communicating the done for you group coaching and digital product. I think once like once you have your your industry figured out, once you have your offer figured out and it's not a a problem with price, but instead it's like they don't have the money but they want to buy what you have to sell, 
your pitch is good, if you're filming good, like once your boat floats, then you can do this. Until then, try not to do this, just focus on one thing. So at the end of the pitch, I say, Mr. Johnson, would you like to know how much this darn thing costs? And they say, yes, I sell. Well, I usually charge X, Y, Z, one, two, and three, four, five, six. But I'm going to present you three options today. I want you to pick the one that's best fit for you. Are you ready? Well, Mr. Johnson, I can literally just, inst I can do it all for you. You sit back, you take credit. I shoulder the responsibility. I run this whole program for you and I guarantee it works. I can do the, I can just do it for you. And I charge $1,500 a month. Month to month, no long-term agreement. Next up is I actually have a eight week program where I walk you through it, provide structured support during our office hours and give you access to all the documents I would have used to make your campaign work. This is gonna cost you $1,000 for our eight week program. And then finally, I can just install it for you. For $749, I can install the ads, the funnels, campaigns, the everything, and you run as far as you can. Which one is a good fit for you? So this is how I, I this is the process I go to to do the setup only. This is just a setup right here. Again, only use this to like if your boat floats, you know it's going to work. And the only reason somebody's not going to pay you money is because they just don't have the fifteen hundred, but they might have seven forty nine or thousand or something like that. Um, once I started presenting this option, I had like uh, I had a med spa in like in in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was like, Jeff, there's no way I could pay you $1,500 month to month. I was like, great. I understand that. I've got three packages. I can do X, Y, and Z. I can pick your poison, whatever you want. She's like, I, I want the middle one. I was like, you got it. It's going to cost you this amount. It's a thousand bucks. I'm going to send you an invoice. I'll stand in the line until you pay. She's like, I can't do that. I'll call you later. I said, oh, well, are you sure? Blah, blah, blah. She paid within like an hour. Great. So she gave me a thousand bucks. I installed everything. Um, and now I'm waiting for her to like show up to her appointment. Um, and she's way past the eight week program. Um, but whatever guys, like it's still money. And I, I would not have gotten 1500 a month out of her, but I got a thousand dollars. And now, by the way, she's saying, can we just upgrade to the $1,500 a month? I said, yes, of course we can. So this is ultimately how, sorry, this is ultimately how I do pick your poison style. I hope that makes sense. Uh, Cameron Lang says, I've heard you talk about the slides or the PowerPoint. You take someone through on a call. Yes, but I cannot show you that. That is inner circle only. We've got demo decks. You get to see me sell. We've got slide decks, proof results, experience, case studies, all that stuff. So Cameron, if you're up for an IC conversation, just hashtag IC, Brett will reach out to you. Um, I can't show you my slides. You know what I mean? Uh, that would just, that, that wouldn't be cool. And so I can't do that. But yeah, I have slides and I sell the same way I do my lunch and learns. Um, I, it's very whiteboard driven. Sometimes I like, I, I have pre-made slides, but it's not like I don't do like this boring shit, right? I write it out and, and it feels much more fun. And it's a really, really good time. So Cameron, I'm sorry, I can't answer your question more in depth, but that's the basic idea. Let's see what else we got going on here. I think that's all the questions from last or the thread from Monday or something like that. Um, so if you got any questions, now is the time to ask. Uh, let's just open questions and answers, um, drop them in the chat and then I'll give my best darndest answer to go ahead and answer them. Um, I can't answer everything by PM or DM. I get hundred PMs a day. I'm actually going to be having someone else like respond to this stuff and, and filter accordingly. Cause like there's no way I can deal with hundred PMs a day, like, and make sure my students are acceptable and get my book up and running, which is going to be cool. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's going to change an industry for the better. It's going to be really effing cool. Um, and get my agency back up and running after I'm done with my book sprint. So like, um, I'll probably have somebody like answering my PMs, but even then, like, it's not going to be great. Um, so yeah, so answer your questions and, and we'll take it from there. Let's see what's going on. Um, Andre says, I've never seen a white label with guarantees. When can these people found? Um, you can actually just ask people in this group. Uh, it's a really good opportunity. Um, I, I think the last time I asked about appointments for insurance, there were like three high quality people are trained by really high quality people. Um, and most white labelers have some level of guarantee. Um, 
and it just, it works. So I, I, I think Andre, like you just haven't asked the right question. Um, every white labeler I've talked to has some kind of guarantee. Um, so maybe like you have not been white labeling for result, but instead of white labeling a tool, if you're white labeling for a tool, there's no guarantees, but if you're white labeling for a result, they guarantee it. Um, so there you go. Shahab says, what's a good price point for a white labeler or percentage? Um, I expect about 20%, um, to be kept for me. So let's just say I signed a deal $2,000 a month. I should be able to do no work and make 400 bucks a month, like no work. What's interesting by the way, is that like, that's probably comparable to the margins I would have made anyway, if I had taken on the client or found VAs or SOPs, um, I could probably push that to 30%, but I'll tell you what, like you can read that big group and you like even the massive agencies that are doing like a half million a month, they still make 20, 30% anyway. So it's like, why not just keep those margins and have a good time? Um, and like, there's big advantages like SOPing and VAing and build the team and all that. But like, like I'm not good with that type of stuff. And you usually have to build the team first and then the business comes second. So like there's no disadvantage in white labeling in the beginning. Everybody that has a big agency white labeled in the beginning and it helps just focus on the prospecting and the sales and not worry about fulfillment. And then said employ an expert that just wants to make a half million dollars a year and live on a beach. So make it 20% and have a good time. I've seen some agencies that have like really strong SOPs and VAs make 30%. But you know what? I'm not going to wait a year and a half to make an extra 10%. I'll just start flipping and take it from there. Uh, Chris Sayer, sorry, dude, I'm not going to pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Chris says, very true. Don't need case studies. I had the best case study you could ask for on my first run. Yep. I hit up more businesses flaunting my case study and no plan. Uh, set up my alarms waiting for owners to flock to me for my golden case study. Yeah, dude. Like, like we are well beyond the, if you build it, they will come economy. It's very much like go find them show them a plan and then build it after. Like you saw Elon Musk make a billion dollars and he wasn't like showing pre-results experience or case studies. He just said, hey guys, I'm building out this thing. This is what it's gonna look like. Do you wanna give me money? It just worked. And for some reason our brains say, if only I had the tool, if only I had the spear, if only I had the car or the house, I get whatever I want. And we all know it's not true. Like just cause you have a Lamborghini doesn't make you more attractive. So you have to fight your brain on that. That's a very like old way of thinking like, like back to like tribe, like when we lived in like huts and stuff like that, like if only I had food, we're not in that economy anymore. So instead of focusing on getting a case study, focus on building a prospecting engine, a sales engine, a fulfillment engine. That's what we talk about in the IC. Um, it's a really, really good time. Um, let's see. <laughs> ben says, that's the name of the, my fantasy football league, pick your poison. Beautiful dude, that's so awesome. Uh, Christine says, tell us about your book. Oh, Christine, it's going to be so awesome. Like, like I am so genuinely excited about this. Like this is not my second book. This is like the, the first real book up until then. This has been like me like dicking around trying to see if it's going to work. I'm not really sure. Like I never like f threw myself in to a book process like I did with this book right here. It's going to be this right here. This is the book coming out. Uh, hard copies will be available later on. They'll look like this, but for the most part, everybody's just going to want to get the ebook anyway and not have to deal with shipping problems or like, where's my book and blah, blah, blah. We're going to deal with that stuff later. Um, but this is the book coming out. Um, and I've been very fortunate to have really smart people guiding me through this process. It's going to be about be about 300 pages or so, uh, 150 if it's single spaced, size 12 font, but nobody's going to read it like that. They're going to read it like size 18 font and double space. So it ends up being like 350, 400 pages. Um, it's every interview we've ever done up until December or so. Um, I wrote 17,000 words. It goes over the 3P process, how to respect how people buy what you have to sell, the wallet campaign, all the good stuff. I think it's going to end up being like like $5.60, something that's going to like just mess up traffic and funnels or something like that, right? Um, and then if you buy the book, you end up getting two or three more mini modules. And then there's an option to, to buy the whole store. And then we've, we're experimenting with a paid monthly mastermind. So I can just pay experts to go live and see what happens. And then there's a done for you prospecting engine offer at the end of it, which is cool. But the end result is like, this book is gonna change an industry for the better. Um, and it highlights like winners in the industry like McKinsey and Chris Trinity and Matt Plapp and John Williams and Rio Pace and Robert and Alex and Josh Rhodes. It's gonna be really, really cool. Um, so yeah, it, it's gonna be awesome. And uh, it should be going live Friday, maybe. 
if we figure out why Thrive Cart and ClickFunnels are fighting. Um, but yeah, it's going to be really, really darn awesome. So yeah, um, let's see what happens. Uh, we've got Gregory that says, uh, is this being recorded? I'm just joining. Of course, they're always recorded. Uh, they're inside of the group. And then I put this on YouTube and then we chop it up and make like little tiny videos to make you realize that I still exist and I have to pay Facebook for rent, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, um, Anthony S. at Turo is flexing on me. Anthony says, uh, last month we did 167, uh, kept about 30K of it. So let's do this real fast. 167 divided by 30, 30 divided by 167. So about 20% margins. So like, that's exactly right. So Anthony, who's my CEO as a service, he's really, really good at his job, his works from big names. I'm happy to have him. Um, and it looks like his business right there does about 20, 30% margin. So there's no reason for me to try to fight like getting up a new a, a new agency and, and pushing down costs and building out SOPs to have the same margin I would by just simply hiring the best in the business. You know what I mean? So just white label the dang thing, get your business up and running fast and have a good time. Um, and what's funny is Anthony continues on and says, and we have 40 employees, software lawyers, all that stuff. So yeah, guys, I mean, Anthony is like top tier. Um, if he's doing 20, 30%, just white label and have a much better time and build out your SOPs later on. Uh, John Carmichael says, do you still recommend writing a page a day and making an ebook to use a tripwire offer for your industry? I think you mentioned this a year ago, if not, I'm mistaken. Actually, John Carmichael, I've changed my line of thinking because of the results I've been having. I genuinely believe that the easiest way to write your book, to write your book is two ways. Let me bring this up. The first interview people in the industry and you've been seeing me do this like i've always wanted to write a real awesome book and highlight real awesome people and the easiest way to do this is interview people in your industry just like i've been doing you've been seeing me do it no big deal right interview people in the industry and uh dictate your thoughts and feelings while driving and this is the weirdest part about my brain by the way like when I'm driving, I feel like I'm a genius. Everything is figured out. It's smart. It makes total sense. I have my genius moments. And then I sit down to write the book and my brain goes, oh, you're a big box of dumb and stupid. Happens all the time. Like there's no reason that my brain all of a sudden switches. And I don't know why. I'm sure there's something about like hunting or, or being on a journey. I don't know. But every time I'm driving, like it just flows out of me. So what I started doing is this right here. Every time I start driving, I use uh, some dictation software on my phone. And that could be otter.ai. Let's just put that, otter.ai. And, and it doesn't matter what it is. It's effectively like a white labeled version of rev.com, but they're using like IBM's Watson or something like that to, to transcribe. It's like 98% great, right? And so I dictate my thoughts and feelings while driving. Um, and then I put into otter.ai and I get an export. Let me just do this right here. And then otter.ai gets me an export. And then from there, I start to edit and change. And I edit and change. Not before, not during, not after. I effectively, I put a wall between the flow and the edits. And this is not something that I've experienced I can do while actually sitting down with a blank plate and writing a book. You have like blank plate disease or something like that. So I do this. I dictate my thoughts while I'm feeling and driving. Well, I dictate my thoughts and feelings while driving. Otter.ai gets me an export and then I edit and change. Uh, and I remember there was like three weeks where I was doing this. I would literally go on a commute to the office. I would sit down in a coffee shop the next day and turn like what was a 15 minute talk which ends up being about like seven pages into solid, good, good readable four pages. Great. So as that's going on, I'm also still interviewing people in my industry. And then I send it off to a copywriter. I use, um, I'm not going to say her name. She's already got too much work. Like every time I highlight her, all of a sudden magic, it takes like three days longer to get my exports out. So I'm not going to say her name anymore. She's getting too famous, but I find a copywriter or an editor they uh, listen and write from the interview. That's it. So some people, it's not show notes. 
it's magazine quality articles that are good enough to be in a book. So it's not a transcription. It's not a fly, uh, line by line. No, it's like a magazine quality article. So these two processes has allowed me to, um, let me copywriter, um, has allowed, allowed me to write my 300 page book, um, without having to feel like I'm writing my book. You know what I mean? It's just like, all right, I did an interview. And so we got five pages out of it. And then I dictated for like 15, 20 minutes on my commute. And then I sat down and edited my own words and I was doing like eight pages a day. It was amazing. Like every, every Friday I was doing eight pages a day. It was nuts. And I, I didn't actually employ this person to do my lunch and learns, even though I should have looking back, I could have done 15 pages a week and 15 pages a week times 10 weeks. So that's 150 pages. That's a mini book every two months, really fast. And I'm sure I could have done a little bit more effort and, and done more writings, but this is how I'm writing my book, John Carmichael. So shower thoughts, car thoughts, driving thoughts, whatever it is, this is how I was doing it. And, and, I'm not being dishonest with this. Like you guys are seeing me do it all the time. Like the book that's coming out, this is just my interviews and thoughts, right? Just like uh, Russell Brunson's book or if Sam Ovens had a book, but he likes webinars and said, but you know what I mean, right? Or his blog post. It's the same idea. That's it. Just the same idea. Um, and I, I think that the content leverage plan or program that I highlighted two lunch and learns ago is how you build tribe and make people realize that you're not going to screw them over. That's okay to spend money. And, and it's not a fly by night organization. It's like, as long as you solve those fears, people are comfortable paying you money. And then you can make sure you get the result. Uh, Will Boyd, who's in the EIC, is going on this same journey for personal trainers, which is really darn cool. And there's two or three other people that are like, mm, I should do that. I should definitely do that. Um, because you can interview people. And then half the time, like if you're a Facebook ad agency owner, interviewing... Um, a plastic surgeon for whatever reason. It's an hour long interview both ways where the plastic surgeon asks about marketing, you're asking about plastic surgery. So you get smart in their industry, they get smart in your industry. At the end, you can always say like, hey, is there anything else you wanna go? Or they're like, so how does Facebook ads work? Oh, I've got this program, blah, blah, blah. And we employ the best people in the industry and et cetera, et cetera. And now you've got a client paying you not $1,500 a month and fighting you on it, but paying you $3,000 a month and happy with it because you've spent an hour understanding their industry and you're not a fly by night organization. So I think this is also like a good client getting strategy. It's actually, it's the opposite for me. <laughs> like every time I do an interview, I end up paying them money. I, either way though, it's pretty funny how that works. Um, but, but I hope that provides some type of context and understanding um, for John Michael's question of like, do you still recommend writing a page a day? I've changed my tone and tune since I gave that speech in LA at, at JR's Mastermind. Now I'm a big proponent of having these two channels just pump out 10 to 15 pages a week um, or 30 or 40 pages a week, and then you're good. I think this is how Russell Brunson writes a book every like six months or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's been a good lunch and learn. Uh, we've gone over a bunch of interesting things. Uh, we didn't even go over the structural pillars of selling, which would have been cool to go over, but we just didn't get there. Um, we went over uh, how to white label and you want to white label for results. Um, and make sure your white labeler for results has SLAs, guarantees, proof, testimonies, case studies, all that stuff. Just rely on their expertise and just be the general contractor. Like they're the happiest people in the business. Uh, they make the most money. Um, it's, it's, it's just so much better to be a general contractor. That's how I'm rebuilding my agency to just build it, be a general contractor. I'm going to do a prospect engine for whoever I want and find a white labeler and just make my 20% and, and grow to hundred K a month and get my $800 a day check on automatic recurring. And I don't have to deal with anything like. Like Target isn't like, oh my God, this coffee machine broke. Let me go ahead and fix it. Target says, call Mr. Coffee. I'm not dealing with that shit. I'm going to do the same exact thing. It's going to be great. Um, and then we talked about how appointment setters work. So this is the mistake that most people make. They say, I need appointments. So I'll hire an appointment setter. That's incorrect. Uh, you need to have a list of people that have said yes. Then have the appointment setter go through that list and then pay them $15 per scheduled appointment. And then a percentage for the closed deal. I don't know the percentage. We talked about the three P's um, to selling when you don't have case studies, which is massively powerful and impactful. Christine says, tell us about your book. I'm more than happy to talk about it. It's coming out in, uh, I think, if, if the back end works. Like we're still trying to fight between Active Campaign, ClickFunnels, Thrivecart, and Zapier. Um, assuming it works Friday. So in like two days. I don't know. I'll have to yell at Alex Sursil and see what happens. Um, and then this is pick your poison cell. So I hope this all makes sense. 
Uh, we're going to do a last call. I've got six minutes left before I got to boogie off and make sure that uh, one of the guys that bought, um, I forget what he got, but I've got a one o'clock I got to take care of. Um, it's going to be pretty darn cool. Oh, also, here's a question for you. I want to do a structured six-week SOP program for agency owners. Who can I pay to teach the dang thing? So I want to have like a structured six-week SOP program for agency owners, but I don't want to pretend that I'm the SOP absolute expert. Like I can do SOPs, but I want like a structured program. Like, so I need a coach. If you know of anybody that that wants to take my money um, and be a coach for my structured six week agency program, um, I think on we're on like our tenth beta student, and like I've got a feeling of it, but I want to pay someone to do this um, and be smarter than me. Uh, tag them in the comments, I guess, because I'd be super psyched to pay them, um, and we'll take it from there. Uh, we've got somebody says. <laughs> I don't know who, but this is hilarious. Somebody says, great info, thank you. What's with the picture of the breasts? It's not breasts, okay? That's my grandmother, and she definitely did not make a perverted painting and said, Jeffrey, I want to create something that matches your logo of a butt, except we can't do butts. And this is definitely not uh, my grandmother's uh, fruit from her art class where they all posed for it. Yes, that's. there's no way in, in hell that is it because... My grandmother's, she's funny or gross. I'm not really sure. But no, uh, that is definitely a picture of um, old women fruit and, and melons and all that stuff because, because yeah. Ladies and gents, we're ending it on that. We had a pretty good time today. I hope I solved your problems, moved you forward, alleviated your pain, got you moving in the right direction. Again, um, if you're white labeling, white label for results. If you don't have three Ps, uh, use case study, or if you, don't have, if you don't have case studies, use the three Ps. Um, and this is what you don't want to do with appointment setters. Everybody, see you later. Bye.